Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to Truth, Lies, and Alibis, the true crime podcast from three friends sharing their perspectives from having years of 911 dispatching experience. Episode 18 The Framing of Stephen Avery. In today's episode, Brittany and I discuss the 1985 assault of Penny Berenstein and how Stephen Avery spent 18 years in prison for the crime he did not commit. My question for today is, have you ever had to take a, it's kind of a, a tough one, but have you ever had to take a 911 call or a call from a sex assault victim? And we don't have to go too much into detail or anything. I just kind of wanted to bring it to light, like what we actually would hear as dispatchers. There was one call I took where the victim called 911 and they were obviously pretty upset. And so Mm -hmm. the phone went immediately to a roommate that was there. So I talked to the roommate and, you know, carried on the call from there and handled it as we needed to. I mean, I know I've taken late reportings of, you know, it's a difficult thing for victims to be able to report, you know, because there's a lot of that fear that goes along with being a victim of something like that so a lot Mm -hmm. of times it's a day or much more later in which they call into report and so I've talked to late reportings the only one off the top of my head I can remember that was like had just happened was the one where I they called 911 and then I ended up taking like finishing the call with the roommate yeah I have taken similar to you somebody called for someone else and said that their friend had been sexually assaulted and she was on her way to get them and asked where you can get um, what we call a rape kit, right? I mean, that's what they were called at the PD. I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I think at the place where they do the, the forensic exams here, that's what they call them, but I'm not 100% positive. When I started going to nursing school, I decided I wanted to be a forensic nurse. So eventually I like want to end up in there. Mm -hmm. and I hope to learn more I have some friends who work there and I think it's really great I also like want to point out that if you are sexually assaulted and you're not sure if you want to report it you can still get a rape kit done and you don't have to report it and they will keep that evidence so that if you decide that you do want to report it it's there so I think that's like an important thing to point out because I before I had started like looking into it I didn't know that that was an option right really or before I worked at the PD because I mean sometimes we get calls for for like kit pickups that aren't there's no report yet but it's just so that we have that evidence on file yep and if anybody's curious or like doesn't believe us that you know the all the information's there what happens is that organization calls us and they tell us that they need a report number for this kit and an officer's not even called we assigned the report number and gave it to them over the phone and then that was it so it doesn't even go to an officer. They have that information. They have that report number. So in the to future, keep track of the evidence, right? In basically. the future, if you know the victim does decide that that's the route they want to take, then you know they they have that available. Yeah, and I another thing that I learned kind of in talking with the people who I made friends with who work there, they tell you like a lot of times that you think that you can't shower afterwards or there won't be any evidence, but that's not true either. So. If you decide after you showered that you wanted to report it, you could go in and you could have some tests done too. I just thought like that's interesting and Mm -hmm. it's like a hard thing to report, right? Absolutely. Especially like you said, just feeling some people feel embarrassed, some people feel scared. Like there's a lot of feelings that go into it and I think it's really brave of people who report it. I think it's really brave of people who don't report it, but either way, I just wanted them to know like you have that option of Mm -hmm. going in and getting a test done. That kind of leads us into today's story. This will be part one of the Stephen Avery case slash rape of Penny Ann Bernstein slash murder of Teresa Halbach. Have you heard of this case? No. I'm sorry. (laughs) So a lot of people who are listening probably have watched Making a Murderer. If you're like me, you've watched it like three or four times. Because you just, like, can't get over how mind-blowing it is. But the reason I chose it was because I knew that Jess would not know anything about it. If you're like, Brittany, you know all about it. If you're like me, you've never heard those names before. So, 
<laughs> exactly. So I kind of wanted to tell it a little bit differently. And I wanted to, so I, when I was researching it, I was like, oh my God, Jess is going to think this. Oh my God, Jess is going to think that. It was like, I was excited again <laughs> to like learn everything. Cause I, the first time I watched the documentary, which everyone, you can watch it. I'm going to do like an overview of the stuff that they talk about in the documentary and some of the stuff I found online mm-hmm. because there's so much, like so much. So if you really want to know more, I recommend the documentary. But also remember, the documentary is kind of biased. So do your own research, you know, mm-hmm. always. I feel like that's a, a, a good blanket for most things. For everything. Yeah. <laughs> kind of do um, your own research and get information from multiple places. <laughs> yes. And make your own opinion. All right. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is the rape of Penny Ann Bernstein. Bernstein? B-E-E-R-N-S-T-E-N. On July 29th, 1985, Penny was running along Lake Michigan and was attacked by a male subject who forced her into a wooded area and attempted to rape her. He then beat her and left her for dead. She described the male subject as a white male wearing a black leather jacket with long sandy hair and brown eyes. She said he was stocky and about 5'6", and a Manawak County deputy sheriff by the name of Judy Dvorak heard her description and commented, that sounds like Stephen Avery. Judy had Penny sign a statement, even though Penny told Judy she couldn't see, and if you watch the documentary, you see a picture of her after the attack because she's in the hospital because he, he beat her severely and left her for dead. And her eyes both are just black Oof. and like shut. And even though Penny said she couldn't see, she still signed the statement because she said, oh, I I have you. Like, basically, she trusted this sheriff, which a lot of people would, right? A sketch artist was then given a jail photo of Stephen Avery. And from that jail photo, basically, this is what is alleged. Allegedly was given a jail photo of Stephen Avery. From that photo, he made a sketch for Penny, and they told her it was based on her description. And then she said, yeah, that looks like him. And then they did a photo lineup with said jail picture. And Jess, I'm not kidding you. In the documentary, they hold up the jail picture and the sketch side by side. They're like identical. Yeah. Well, if they gave it to the sketch artist to use, then it would look the same. Yes. And it came out later that he framed this sketch and this photo, basically, and hung it on his wall. The artist did? Uh huh. Because he said it was the first one that ever led to like someone being convicted. I don't know. It's mind blowing. They so they're already skewing the evidence though because. Yep. Okay. Oh, I just want to make sure I'm following. Okay. <laughs> You're like, wait, why? See, this is why I want to tell it to you from this way because I want to kind of get like your idea on what happened without you being on the side the documentary puts you on. Yeah. So so let me. See. So I got I got Penny. 1985 sexually assaulted and brutally beaten Mm -hmm. left Left for for dead dead. and then when she speaks to law enforcement Mm -hmm. law enforcement goes oh that description sounds like this guy that we already don't like yep finds his booking photo has a Mm -hmm. police sketch done takes the police sketch to the victim and says is this the guy Mm -hmm. and then takes the original booking photo in a photo lineup in which looks just like the police sketch she's already confirmed Correct. Okay. All right. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm tracking. You're tracking. From there, Avery was picked out of the photo lineup, and then Penny did a live lineup and identified him. Because, hello, not only has she seen this sketch that looks just like him, she's picked this picture that looks just like the sketch. And this officer is saying that sounds a lot like Stephen Avery. This guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, Stephen Avery was well known to the sheriff's office because... He had a pretty extensive criminal history. Sandra Morris, Stephen Avery's cousin, who was, by the way, married to a sheriff's deputy, pointing that out, had accused Stephen of indecent exposure for, quote, masturbating on the hood of her car. However, the report kind of made it sound like she was driving by. So how did he masturbate on top of her car? Lots of questions here. Okay. Okay. She also says he would have sex with his wife on his lawn where neighbors could see, which, like, maybe that's true, but ew. He also had served some time in jail for animal cruelty. You're going to hate this. He lit a cat on fire. Okay. So, I mean, he is trash, kind of, if you ask me. That's my opinion of him, okay? 
I mean, but, let's the the my my standard. I'm gonna throw this out there to to the general public. It takes a a special kind of evil to hurt an animal because they're they have never done they don't do wrong, right? Well, like it's they're this, those people who like to hurt people or things that are more vulnerable than them. Mm-hmm. It just gives them that like power trip. He also had some charges for burglary on his record for crawling into a bar through a broken window and stealing. Are you ready for this? Fourteen dollars and quarters, two six packs of PBR, and two cheese sandwiches. Okay, <laughs> that's what he made out with. So he needed a snack and beverages while doing his laundry. He needed those quarters <laughs> for laundry. I was thinking, what did he do with all those quarters? He also had charges for endangering safety while whilst evading a depraved mind after driving his cousin's car off the road and pointing a gun at her. So, like I said, he wasn't the best person. Stephen would admit he ran her off the road, but he would not admit, admit that he had uh, to the masturbating or the sex on his lawn. So he admitted to all that stuff, but he wouldn't admit to certain things, which is like, if you're going to admit to something, like, I, I have this feeling that if he was going to admit to one thing, he would have admitted to all of it, kind of, you know what I mean? Like, why would he hide? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's like, I'm going to admit to the more serious charge, but I'm not going to admit to... Yeah, I, I ran you who off knows? the road, but I wouldn't masturbate on your car. Gross. Or have sex with my wife on the lawn, which is like, where did she come up with this shit? But whatever. So, Avery was convicted of the crime and spent... So, he was convicted, ultimately convicted of the rape and of Penny. Like, attempted murder of Penny. And spent 18 years out of a 32-year sentence in prison. He, the whole time, he said, I didn't do it. So he, another thing about Avery is he was married. He had five children. His wife had just had twins. Oh my gosh. Yeah. After losing several appeals, the judge granted a petition for new DNA testing in 1995. And the fingernail scrapings from Bernstein's fingernails were tested. And DNA from an unknown person was found. However, it couldn't eliminate Avery, so his motion for a new trial was denied. While in prison, Lori, the wife of Stephen and mother of his five children, wrote letters to Stephen, and Stephen would write her back. And later, these letters would come out, and in those letters, she threatens to kill herself and the kids, basically, because she's, like, miserable, which, raising five kids alone, like, I raised four kids alone for a while, and I never felt that way, but I know it's frustrating, Mm -hmm. and I think she already had some issues, because if you watch, like, the documentary and stuff, it kind of... Avery's IQ was low. I think they said that he had like a 70 or something for an IQ. Do you know? I don't know anything about IQs, but I know it's not the best. Most people have an IQ between 85 and 115. Average IQ in the United States is 98. Okay, so he definitely had below average IQ. And his wife kind of had some issues of her own, so I think she needed help. Plus, she had just had twins, right? When he, like, he had, they think they, he had just brought them home or something. And it was, like, a few days later that he was arrested. And I'm sure that there's community backlash as well, because her husband just went to prison for this horrible crime. So people aren't going to keep their, their feelings about that private. I'm sure she had a ton of backlash. Yeah, I'm sure. It comes out later that a lot of that county doesn't like the Avery family, just the family in general. And, I mean, he had a a record, so they probably already didn't like him. And they probably are like, like you said, they're like, what the heck? Your husband raped this lady and almost killed her. Mm -hmm. So in those letters, she threatens to kill herself and the kids, basically. And then Stephen threatens to kill her if she doesn't bring the kids to see him, which sounds like there was some kind of DV toxic energy in that relationship, it seems like. So, in April of 2002, the Wisconsin Innocence Project obtained a court order for DNA testing on the 13 hairs recovered from Bernstein the day of the crime. The crime lab linked the hairs using the FBI DNA database to to a convicted felon named Gregory Allen. Gregory Allen, who looked similar to Stephen Avery, was serving a 60-year prison sentence for a 1995 sexual assault and kidnapping in Green Bay that occurred after the attack on Penny Bernstein. He had also been arrested for lewd and lascivious acts not related to this incident or the rape of Penny. And on top of that, at the time of Penny's attack, there was an actual surveillance operation on him because he was a sex offender or he or they thought he had something to do with that and the day that she was attacked those people who were doing surveillance were called to other crime scenes and he was left alone 
Did he did he know that he was being watched? I don't know, but it kind of seems like it. Like mm-hmm. nothing in the documentary st- said if he knew or not. Nothing I could find online. L- literally, I was shocked because the stuff that I have in here, I found one article online really, and then I it's the stuff I watched in the documentary. There's mm-hmm. not a lot, and I'm like, that seems weird because there should be because they framed Stephen. I mean, they framed him, yeah, for this rape. And they knew this guy was out there. And that's just like, that's crazy to me because they're putting everybody else in danger. So it it was the same agency that... I think it was the same agency because he was on that same beach. So it was from from that same general area. Okay. So some officers went to the DA to tell them that Gregory Allen had been the rapist from the beginning. And, like, some women in the DA's office had, like, pointed out that they looked similar. Um, Stephen Avery also had 22 alibi witnesses that said he was pouring concrete and watching divorce court that day, but that nobody believed him because they were Avery's. Or they chose not to believe him. Like, they actively just disregarded everything they said. Yeah. He also claimed that he didn't even own underwear. <laughs> which would go against the white underwear found on the scene of the crime, which would later be determined to be Gregory Allen's. On September 11th, 2003, a request brought by the DA office and the Innocence Project was granted to dismiss the charges, and Avery was then released. After 18 years. After serving 18 years for a crime he didn't commit. And for those whole 18 years, he said he was innocent. He would not plea to anything. He wouldn't admit to anything because he could have gotten out earlier if he had said i'm sorry i did do this but he wouldn't in 2005 the wisconsin department of justice adopted a model eyewitness identification protocol with the help from stephen avery and bernstein according to the cornell university law school current data suggests that eyewitness misidentification is the largest contributor to wrongful convictions of those exonerated through dna testing In fact, eyewitness misidentification was a factor in the wrongful conviction of more than 175 individuals, over 75%, who were eventually exonerated. These cases typically involve several additional complications. For instance, multiple eyewitnesses may misidentify the same person. Mm -hmm. This has occurred in 38% of the cases. And further, eyewitness testimony was the central evidence in over 50% of such cases. Eyewitness testimony itself isn't very reliable, right? But then you add in the fact that these officers actively pointed her to Stephen and, yeah. like, made her think that she was right, right? Well, they skewed her memory. Yeah, they definitely did. it. And if you look at their pictures, I'm going to pull them up. They look similar, but They different. do look similar. Yeah, I, they could be related. I could see the similarities for sure. If you notice, Stephen's the one with, like, the beard and the shagginess. The other guy had, like, a mustache, I think. According to the Wisconsin Department of Justice eyewitness identification policy, each law enforcement agency shall adopt written policies for using an eyewitness to identify a suspect upon viewing the suspect in person or upon viewing a representation of the suspect. The policy shall be designed to reduce the potential for erroneous identifications by eyewitness in criminal cases. And then another quote, recent studies of eyewitnesses and human memory have suggested that eyewitness evidence is much like trace evidence left at a crime scene. Like trace evidence, eyewitness memory is an imprint left in the mind of the witness, but also like trace evidence, it is susceptible to contamination if not handled properly. The result can be failure to identify the true perpetrator or erroneous identification of an innocent person. After being freed, Stephen Avery decided to sue the county and various employees. It was like a multi-million dollar lawsuit. And the insurance wasn't going to cover, it wouldn't be paid out by insurance. He sued each individual person, kind of. They were all going to have to end up paying for sending him to prison, which they should. Yeah. In 2016, an article on the Marshall Project was released where a statement from Penny was written. I'm going to read it to you, Jess. But it can be found online. For a long time, she didn't choose to speak out. She felt like af- at first she felt like people were supporting her, right? And were understanding and wanted her to heal. And then she felt like people kind of made her the bad guy because she had pointed to this guy and sent him to prison for 18 years. That sheriff's department used her as a tool to put away this guy that they didn't like. Yep. 
I mean, she was she was manipulated. She, I mean, she was a victim too. Absolutely, she was the victim of this crime, right? She was the victim of Gregory Allen, and then she was the victim of these sheriff deputies who used her to put Stephen Avery away because they had this thing against him because he was an Avery, and I mean, because he had a weird past. Probably that had a lot to do with it too. But this is, in her own words, what it was like to discover that she had misidentified him. The day I learned of the exoneration was worse than the day I was assaulted. I really fought back when my attacker grabbed me. I scratched him. I kicked him. I did not go gently. After the DNA results came back, I just felt powerless. I can't unring this bell. I can't give Steve back the years that he's lost. At the time, I didn't know anything about how memory works, about what good procedures are, about showing lineups to victims. The perpetrator was not in the photo lineup I was shown. I never had an opportunity to identify my actual assailant. It was a simultaneous lineup where witnesses are shown all photos at once. There were nine photos and they looked carefully at each one and picked Stephen Avery's. The sheriff later put together a live lineup. There were eight men and I again picked Stephen Avery. He was the only person who was in both, so it's logical that I would pick him. After the exoneration, there was a lot of publicity. Steve was made out to be a hero, and I went from having sympathy to being this horrible person who made a mistake and is responsible for someone's suffering. The first time I went out in public, an acquaintance of mine said, I can't believe you're brave enough to show your face. That would not be an acquaintance of mine anymore. No. The man I misidentified was 23 years old at the time. He had five children and twin sons who were just a few days old. There was really no physical evidence connecting the two of us. It was a she said, he said case, and my testimony sent an innocent person to prison. His kids have grown up without him. I absolutely wanted the earth to swallow me. Steve had always maintained his innocence. They ran an ad in the newspaper trying to raise money for attorney fees. A friend of mine saw it and called me and said, I just wanted to let you know that Steve's running ads saying he's innocent. Every time he was granted an appeal, it's like, am I going to be called to testify again? There's this nonstop video of the crime going through your head. I lived across the street from a gentleman who was a teacher at the school that Steve's twin sons attended, and he had them in class. At one point, this must have been a good dozen years after the crime, Craig approached me and said, Are you sure that Stephen Avery was the guy who attacked you? Because his wife, Lori, insisted she was with him all day and that he couldn't possibly have committed it. And I remember saying, No, I am really sure. But that planted the first seed of doubt. I would find a way to explain away any bit of information that suggested he was innocent. In the trial, I had testified that when the perpetrator unzipped his pants and exposed himself, I saw white fabric and I assumed he must be wearing white underwear. His wife testified that Steve never wore underwear. He didn't own any underwear, so that troubled me. But then one day, I'm hanging clothes on the clothesline outside and I see these white pockets on the jeans and I think, oh, that's why I saw white. When the Innocence Project took the case, I just fell apart. I was angry. Does this mean that every time technology improves, he's just going to get another opportunity? Isn't there anything to this concept of judicial finality? I called the victim coordinator and said, if there's going to be any kind of hearing, I want to be notified and I want to be in court because I want the Innocence Project attorneys to have to look at my face and see that there's a survivor behind this crime and this is just hell to be going through this again. The first time I was in court, Keith Finley of the Innocence Project came up to me and said, I'm very sorry, this must be very difficult for you. I know you went through a horrendous assault. I think I snapped back with something snarky like, I wish I could believe you were sincere. Now I consider Keith Finley a friend. He and the other attorneys at the Innocence Project have always been very victim sensitive. By the time the DNA testing was done, but before the results came back, I think I had calmed down a little. A part of me was thinking, gosh, Steve got a 32-year sentence. That's a pretty long sentence when you're 23 years old. The next time he comes up for parole, maybe I won't write out a parole board objecting to him being released. But I was pretty convinced that he was my perpetrator. The day I met Steve in February of 2004, my heart was beating so hard I thought, I'm going to have a heart attack. And we sat down, and he is a person of very few words, although he was polite and attentive. When we finished, I said, I would welcome the opportunity to apologize to your parents, but I totally understand if they don't want to be in the same room with me. His response was, I think my mom would be okay, but I think my dad is very bitter. And then he apologized for his dad's bitterness. I remember saying, Steve, I have a son. If someone accused my son of doing to a woman what I accused you of doing to me, I would be bitter if I knew my son was innocent. Your dad knew that you were innocent because you were with the family that day. Much to their credit, his parents agreed to hear what I had to say. They were even more nonverbal than Steve was. I said, do you have any questions of me? And Dolores, his mother, just shrugged. 
The day he was released from prison in September, he said, I don't blame the victim. What happened to her was horrible. It's the cops that set me up. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really troubled me is that I was one of the only people who apologized to Steve. It would have been nice for the prosecutor or the sheriff to say, actually, we got it all wrong. I felt like I was the only one taking responsibility. The police department called me a couple weeks after the assault and said they had another suspect in mind. They didn't give me a name, but it turns out it was Gregory Allen. I hung up and I called the sheriffs and I said, what's this about another suspect? I was told, do not talk to the police department. It will only confuse you. So the sheriff's office told her not to talk to the police department is what it sounds like. Hmm. It goes on. There's more stuff in here. She basically says that she still saw him as her assailant because... They basically brainwashed her into thinking that, and she had to go to therapy. And then, I guess, I am not defending Stephen Avery at all for being, like, a good person. I'm just saying that he didn't deserve to go to prison for He was for not guilty years. for that crime. Yes. Because a lot of stuff that comes out, which we will discuss on the next episode, will be... It's not great, the stuff that comes out. But... She says, then I got a call that a young woman has gone missing and that the last place she was seen was on Stephen Avery's property. So my emotions regarding Stephen Avery are complicated. But I kind of wanted to talk about, like, could you imagine? You think, right, you have these officers telling you that you're putting this guy away. He's the person who did it to you. You think 100% that he is the person who attacked you. Well, there's there's a lot of compounding factors in that, right? That begin with the sketches and the lineups and everything that she's given. That Gregory is not even in there, even nope. though the sheriff's office is aware of who this guy is. He's not even listed within it. And that she's kind of being herded in the direction of Avery. And so there's that, right? And and there's this, especially in the 80s, like, these are law enforcement officers. I can trust them. They're here to help me. There was a lot of that. And so you wouldn't think twice about it. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't be like, maybe I need to take a step back and really take a look and go against my memory. Like, if this is what I remember versus I trust these deputies. These are the eight people that they're lining up for me. And I recognize that one. Mm-hmm. So you have that compounded on top of. The entire court process she went through. The court process in which you're supposed to be able to trust, which put him away. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the fact that they had witness accounts, that he had an alibi, they had all this stuff that went towards his innocence, they still put him away. So that's another, another layer for Penny to believe, like, this backs up my memory. I know he's guilty because I trust this, this system and that system says he's guilty. And so not only that, but then you have 18 years of her being able to think that she can rest easy because her perpetrator's put away. Then all of a sudden, like, you start having these doubts and things like that. And then you and then that gets introspective because it's, well, why am I doubting myself when everybody else agreed with me and they're the ones that put him away? Well, that trauma, too. Like, I mean, I read somewhere that he wasn't actually able to, like, fulfill his rape, basically, like. But he attempted to. He did beat her, left her for dead. Like, that whole trauma. But I don't say that against her. Like, I say that against him because... What, was he mad because he couldn't keep it up so he took it out on her? Like, you shouldn't have been attacking her in the first place, you freaking psychopath. And just think about that next victim that he went on to hurt. Right. There are so many victims of this crime. So many victims of this crime. It's mind-blowing. Like, you're talking about all this stuff that she's gone through, all this stuff about, like, trusting the sheriffs and then questioning her own memory. It's like she was, like, gaslit into basically believing that Stephen was her attacker, right? Yeah. So then Gregory Allen, her actual attacker, is free to go on and hurt other women. He had hurt other women before. That's one of the things that's always been so frustrating about I don't want people to take me the wrong way. Like, I am not one to speak in absolutes. Any, all, and every when you're accusing somebody of something is bullshit. Yeah. I don't want to be taken the wrong way when I say that. One of the things that's always been frustrating, even as a civilian, not somebody that's worked in law enforcement, but when you hear about cases like this, it's their 
personal beliefs, their personal feelings that they had against Avery shouldn't have come into the factor with this because their true passion should have been to solve that actual crime. Yes, and to get justice for the victims. They just let her attacker go free. There's just like a lot. Also, there's a lot like in covering this up, like how many people were involved. Yeah. The entire sheriff's office was involved. The sheriff himself was involved. It never should be, regardless of what area of law enforcement you're working in, any personal feelings you have towards somebody should absolutely be thrown away because it's not about that person. It's about the crime and the victim that happened and taking care of that, of what happened, not your own personal, well, I think so-and-so did that. No, no, no. You're not, you're not allowed to think that. You're not in a job in which you can say, well, I don't like so-and-so because he speaks to me poorly and he doesn't respect me. Cool. That's, I'm sorry. That's not what your job's about. Your job is solving a crime when it happens to a victim. And the DNA wasn't a thing back then, right? We've talked about it. It didn't become a thing until like the 90s. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they could have tested DNA or whatever. But this, the sheriff's deputy was also friends with Stephen's cousin. And what were they, I mean, maybe they were mad because he wasn't facing charges for masturbating on her car or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, just, just to think about like, one, all of the people involved. And how there are police departments out there that exist like this, which is is terrifying. It's unfortunate, yeah. To think about. And then all of the victims, right? Not only was Penny a victim, and then Stephen was a victim, then his wife. And his all family, of their kids. The yep. children that had to grow up without him, which I don't know if that was good or bad, right? Because he had a lot going on, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't fair. He's not squeaky clean. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> no. But it wasn't fair to them. Yeah. Then it trickles down to the next victims of Gregory Allen being pulled in. It's just sad. And it's mm -hmm. like, how does this happen? And I mean, I think that they did a good thing because like they got that eyewitness protocol put in place. Right. Mm -hmm. So they took... They took this bad and they worked together to make sure that that was a thing, which it should be a thing. It should have been a thing to begin with, right? Memories are complicated, yeah. especially when you go through a traumatic situation. And eyewitness testimony should not be the only reason that somebody goes to jail nowadays. Like, yeah, it should be part. Right. Like, and sometimes people remember things accurately. Sometimes. Hopefully, most of the time, they're not brainwashed and just thinking that some guy that so-and-so doesn't like was their attacker. Yeah. yeah. From there, after getting out, he decides to sue them for $36 million. And it was a lawsuit against the county and former officials, and that's a lot of money, which will lead us into, like, what happens next. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about it on the next episode. One of the things that I'm glad you brought it up again because I wanted to comment the eyewitness things is that they compare it to trace evidence, right? And they say that trace evidence can get compromised and so can eyewitness testimony, right? And memory. Memory is a big thing. I remember specifically spending time like way back in the day when I went to college and I was taking those psychology courses. Like we even talked about memory then and it's not even a, a like sometimes memories are tainted you don't remember anything as it happens each person's memory will be different because each person's mind is different and each person pays attention to different things based on life experiences what catches their attention and like there's plenty of studies and like research specifically on witness memory take a group of people have them all watch the same thing afterwards tell me what you saw each of those people will describe something different so exactly what you were saying, that should not be the sole thing responsible for putting someone away. Yep. Even like when you think about it, like my siblings remember our childhood way differently than I remember our childhood, right? Yeah. Yeah. Even Nova remembers things differently than I remember them. And then right. her siblings remember, you know, so it's just crazy. It's just crazy that they literally stole 18 years of this man's life because they basically fed her a memory. And it's not fair to her either because it's not fair to her to feel like she's paying the consequences for that. It was narrowed down for her, right? Like, if it's the same face you're seeing and everything the police are giving you, then... 
that's what you're going to believe is responsible. Mm -hmm. So essentially being like herded towards this one person and then later down the line, like without the light of everything that happened to get her to that point, it's not like she had anything vindictive against Avery. She was led that way. People can get caught up in the like, oh, she's terrible. Like grab your torch and pitchforks. Like let's go after it's her fault. Like, why don't you look at the situation as a whole? Like, her attacker wasn't even in those lineups. She was never even given a full lineup to be able to actually find her suspect. Well, and if you're going to be mad at someone, why aren't you mad at the people who did it? Why aren't you mad at those sheriff's deputies who... Orchestrated the whole thing. Yeah. It's so obvious that from the beginning, she saw an opportunity to do this, and she took it, and she ran with it. Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at truthliesandalibis.